Good morning, good morning, Eva. Good morning, uh, everyone. I can see uh, uh, some friends and colleagues from Tokyo and Europe looking at the list of participants. This is webinar number 15 of the EU Japan Technology Transfer Help Desk, and the title is What Can IT Do for New Technologies Such as VR and AR? Today we have two special guests, and they are here with me in. Uh, same room at the Japan Center in Tokyo. So I would like to, uh, before reading their bios, maybe give uh, to those that do not know what we do, uh, just a brief introduction about the help desk. As you can see here from this uh, slide in front of you, um, there's my name. I'm running the help desk here in Tokyo. And here you also have my email if you want to be in touch. So feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions. You also have the URL of the website that I urge you to um, visit. And please do send us any comments you might have. And also, I would encourage you to register uh, and get a, a copy of our digital newsletter uh, by following also the URL that you see here at the bottom of the slide. And I would also now start introducing our guests. Uh, we have uh, two speakers uh, from the firm Sonoda & Kobayashi here from Tokyo. And I will start with uh, reading the bio of Dr. Sonoda, that has spent several years in France conducting research for the French Atomic Energy Commission. He has over 28 years of experience in IP in Japan, including 10 years as a director of a major Japanese IP firm before founding Sonoda and Kobayashi here in Tokyo. He holds a PhD in structural engineering from the University of Tokyo, and his expertise lies in nuclear technology, thermodynamics, electrical and mechanical engineering, liquid crystals, fluid mechanics, optics, computing, aeronautical and automotive engineering, and electromagnetism. And he often appears before the JPO, IP High Court, representing his clients in adversarial cases, such as pattern infringement lawsuits. And Dr. Sonoda is fluent in Japanese, English, and French, of course. Then we also have Nicole, Nicole Bigler. Is, she's the director of the International Affairs Department at Sonoda Kobayashi, IP law firm. She studied Japanese studies in banking and finance at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Nicole moved to Japan in 2012, joined the firm in 2013, and she has specialized since then in comparative IP laws of Japan, US, and Europe. She's a speaker at numerous conferences abroad and frequently visits our international, their international and domestic clients. Nicole currently heads the Department of International Affairs and acts as a liaison between foreign clients and Japanese pattern attorneys and engineers. She serves on the boards of management directors and bringing a Western outlook on strategic and development matters. Nicole also is fluent in German, English, Japanese, and French. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker. Nicole, welcome, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luca. Welcome to our webinar about intellectual property in the AR, VR environments. We're going to be talking about five topics today. We're going to start with the uncharted territory of AR, VR, and intellectual property. That means we're going to give a brief overview of what has been going on in these technical fields, what patent applications have been filed, what the problem with them, and what is the current status. Then we're going to give a very brief introduction about intellectual property and the different categories that are there. Then we're going to tell you what IP can do for AR, VR business developments. And then we're going to look at the cross-border enforcement of rights. That means between the real world and the virtual reality, augmented reality worlds. And in the end, we're going to look a little bit at the costs of protecting your inventions. So first of all, uncharted territory of AR, VR, and intellectual property. What actually is AR and what is VR? First, let's look at augmented reality. So that is a technology that superimposes a computer-generated image on a user's view of the real world, thus providing a, comp a composite view. That basically means that augmented reality simulates artificial objects in the real environment. A very good example that we have been seeing over the last year is the Pokemon game. Which are the relevant patent rights for augmented reality? When it comes to patents, basically, 
there is no different to inventions of other um, technologies like pharmaceutical or mechanics. However, if you look at copyrights, trademarks, designs, and right of publicity, you're going to see a lot of per particularities in how you have to protect your rights. Big players of augmented reality inventions are Nintendo with the Pokemon Go game, Microsoft with the HoloLens, or Google with the Google Translate app or Inquest. Then, what is virtual reality? The use of computer technology to create a simulated environment. Unlike traditional user interface, virtual reality places the user inside an experience. So basically, the human is a visual creature. And display technology is often the single biggest difference between immersive virtual reality systems and traditional user interface. Which relevant IP rights are in connection with virtual reality? That's basically the same as with the augmented reality. No big difference with patents, but when it comes to trademarks, copyrights, designs, or right of publicity, there are a lot of particularities, which we will talk about later in the presentation. Who are the big players in virtual reality? That's Oculus, Sony with Project Morpheus, and Samsung, Google, and uh, lately we hear a lot about Magic Leap and are all very much waiting for the product to come out. Why should AR VR stakeholders care for intellectual property, actually? So IP rights are the sole means to protect creative ideas from plagiarism. While other proprietary rights address tangible assets, for example, cell phones, cars, etc., only intellectual property rights address intangible assets, such as the ideas, designs, information secrets, and trademarks. So where with tangible assets, if you're holding them, actually, then nobody can abuse it without you realizing it. However, with intellectual property rights, somebody might be abusing it without you even knowing. That's why you need to protect your rights. IP laws enable exclusive possession of your intellectual property in the name of the law. And of course, exclusiveness of provides huge advantages in your businesses. However, what is actually the problem? The laws do not develop as quickly as technologies do. IP laws are modified almost every year to catch up with technology developments, but still far behind the end. Laws can never be a front runner of the society's evolution. So, because of that, the lawyers are now applying existing laws and legal frameworks to the new technologies, such as AR and VR, but often, actually, it is a little bit misfitting. AR VR stakeholders must be well aware of the IP laws and take advantages from them, but being aware of their limits is also important. Now, let's look a little bit about numbers and figures. So far, 3,000 international patent applications have been published with either EAR or VR. Especially 2016 was very important with the growth of 43%. So it's happening now, actually, that the market is taken by the new players. If you look at the distribution by technology, then you can see that most of them were in content creation. Then we have a little bit of display and device interaction, platform, and object tracking sensors. Looking at the companies behind these applications, the major applicants in VR, and that's the, in, in the number of applications, Microsoft being by far the biggest one, then Google, IBM, Intel, Sony, Broader Industries, Samsung, LG Electronics. Other important applications with the VR technology come from BAE Systems, Huawei, Magic Leap, and Oculus. Then with AR, it's again Microsoft that files the most patent applications. Then Qualcomm, Intel, Empire Technology, Magic Leap, Dockery, Samsung, and LG Electronics and Sony. Also important applications coming from BAE Systems, Huawei, and ZTE. Having that said, the majority of applications in both of these technical field, fields are coming from small startup companies which have like one or two, three patent applications. So this is now a chance for a small startup to come up with a great innovation and become a future market leader. Where are the applications actually coming from by country? 
So more than half is originated in the US, followed by Japan, then others, which is mostly from Taiwan, but can also be Israel or Russia, Korea, China, and Europe, at the moment still a little bit behind. Looking closer at Japan, you can see that especially augmented really, AR inventions have been increasing a lot over the last couple of years. Let's look at two examples, one in virtual reality and one in augmented reality. This is a US patent that was filed in August 2009 and already issued actually in 2012, 2012 by Sugara, US company, providing a simulation of wearing items such as garments and or accessories. So basically, that simulates your shopping experience. So you do not have to go to a shop anymore, but you can just choose the items that you want to wear, and it's going to simulate it on your picture. That's definitely going to make shopping much, much more easier. Then another example from the augmented reality environment is this US patent, which was just issued this June in summer and was filed by the Universal Studios and it's basically about an invention where a viewer is wearing AR goggles when being on a ride and that will create some char fictional characters on the ride that are going to appear in between. So maybe next time when you go to the Universal Studios you can see that. So now let's come to the next topic. We're going to give a brief overview of what is intellectual property rights for the people that are not that much used to it yet. Let's first look at patents. Patents protect invention from copying and enable licensing. The requirements are it must be a highly advanced creation of technical ideas utilizing natural laws. Other requirements are novelty, inventive step, and industrial applicability. The protection lasts for 20 years from filing date, and it takes about 14 to 24 months in Japan to get your patent granted from examination. Other jurisdictions, it might take a little bit longer, as Japan is now at the fastest jurisdictions. So what is actually patentable subject matter in Japan? The reason we are asking this question here is that a lot of inventions in the field of AR VR are in connection with software inventions. Software inventions, however, are notorious for being difficult to get registered. So let's look at the example of Japan. An invention must be an advanced creation of a technical idea utilizing a law of nature. It means a software is a patentable subject matter if it handles physical, chemical, biological data or it includes access to hardware. So for example, a program for controlling luminance of visual image to be displayed on a screen, that's patentable. However, software is not patentable if it is just a manipulation of non-physical, chemical, biological data. So, for example, a program for determining stock on which investment should be made. That cannot be become a patent in Japan. But in general, one can say that software inventions in, in Japan are patentable. In practice, most applications satisfy the requirements of how software is implemented to solve a problem. But the clarity rejection is raised because of hardware, hardware is not resistant. That can overcome by amend, amending the claims. So do not hesitate to contact us or your Japanese counsel if you need advice on how to overcome the office action that is raised and how do you have to amend the claims so you can get your patent granted. Some other examples. Um, hardware to realize AR VR methods for driving the hardware and methods for making the hardware are patentable. For example, Wraparound display screens, wearable computers to create an augmented reality, haptic devices, image data processing technology, and 3D modeling software together with AR VR display devices. The Japanese patent law is most tolerant towards software if you compare it to other jurisdictions. What we are seeing now is that frontrunners like Sony, Microsoft, Oculus, and HTC are trying to dominate this new niche as fast as possible by filing as many patent applications as possible. What can be problems with patent applications in this technical area? 
So it's becoming crowded now with all these new applications. So it's become going to become more difficult coming up with a completely new idea in the future. Also, special drafting skills are necessary to obtain a patent for software. Now we're coming to trademarks. <coughs> so trademarks protect trademarks from uh, excuse me. The trademark right protects trademarks from unauthorized users. What are the requirements? A trademark needs to be distinctive, and there cannot be any similar trademarks. Also, no, it cannot be misleading regarding the origin of the product or service. Examples can be a word, a slogan, a number, a drawing, or a logo. The protection lasts for 10 years, however, it can be renewed indefinitely, which is a big difference to patents or other IP rights, which will expire sooner or later. That gives the trademark a huge value. In Japan, it takes about 5 to 12 months to get your trademark registered. Once goodwill is attached to a trademark, it becomes a huge asset for a company. If you look at the logos of Google, Microsoft, Walmart, IBM, everybody knows that these brands are very valuable. The protection is limited to registered trademarks and good services, including similarities. The trademark law does not prohibit use of registered trademark if the good services are not similar. Also, when a trademark is well known or famous, the unfair trade prohibition law will provide protection in addition. The next category is industrial design. The law protects designs from unauthorized making, using, or selling of products as long as the pro product is designated and the design is identical or similar. So very important for Japan, the, the products must be designated. Other requirements are there cannot be any similar designs, of course, and uh, the creativeness of designs. So it cannot just be an improved design of something that already existed. Examples can be a cell phone, a display on a cell phone, or an icon on a display on a cell phone. The types of products for which design has nothing to do with buying motive are exempted. So for example, an electronic circuit made on a semiconductor chip cannot be registered as it is industrial design. Protection lasts for 15 years. And same as with trademarks, it takes about 5 to 12 men, months to get registration. Copyrights. Copyrights is different from the previous categories in many ways. So it protects the rights of authors and creators. However, you do not need to register it to be protected. The creation must be original, so like in the other examples. What can become a copyright, for example, literacy work, academic work, musical work, choreographic work, architectural work, cinemographic work, photographic work, computer program, etc. The copyright is valid for 50 years from the death of the creator, according to the Japanese law. However, if the creation is made independently of the original, it is exempted from copyright's exclusivity, even if it is identical, similar to the original which is different from patents and trademarks. So, unfortunately, creation is not always for free. Um, patents, trademarks, designs require filing of an application examination in front of the patent offices. This costs time and money. So you need to have an investment to get your invest in inventions protected. Copyrights, on the other hand, is automatically protected and you not, do not need to invest at all. Unfair competition is prohibited by law regardless of whether a trademark tr or trade dress product shape, company name, place of origin, etc. are registered. Now I would like to give the word to Dr. Sonoda to continue. Thank you, Nicole. So now I'd like to continue. And uh, the first topic is what can intellectual property rights do for AR, VR businesses? So far, we explained that there are at least four different types of properties in intellectual property. Patents, trademarks, designs, and copyright. And uh, what these rights can do for AR, VR business is different. Let's see how they are different. The first uh, intellectual property right is patents. And 
patent is uh, applicable for all new inventions and of course applicable for AR, VR related invention. And we'd like to propose strategic use of patents here. What we want, would like to propose is to file a patent application when a new idea is concrete enough. We advise not to wait that the product is made or a business is started. What is important is to file a patent application before this occurs. And after that, you should decide within three years whether the invention was more investment. Because it happens very often that at the beginning, when the invention is created, you think that this is a great invention. But after one year or two years, it turns out that there is even better invention. And the first one becomes less important. That can happen. And if the answer to the first question, whether the invention is worth more investment, is yes, then what you have to do is to request examination and obtain a patent to block others from copying your idea in the manufacturing and selling of products. This is the main purpose of getting a patent. But if your answer is no, the invention does not, is not worth more investment, then leave the application as it is. And the patent application will block others from obtaining a patent for the same or similar idea. This is a second use of the patent application. One thing I'd like to draw your attention is that very often a series of new products need a series of patents and patent applications. Therefore, for good invention, you need to file more than one patent application. That happens quite often. The second uh, intellectual property right is trademark. And uh, our comment regarding trademark in connection with AR, BR is quite different from the comments on patents. We, we say, be cautious about others' trademarks. It is because an authorized use of others' trademark for the designated goods or services can constitute the infringement of trademark right. Therefore, we need to be very careful not to infringe others' right. And on top of that, use of a well-known trademark in a manner that confuses customers about the origin may constitute unfair competition. This is not a question of trademark law, but this is our unfair competition, which is prohibited by the law. And if a trademark is even well-known, that is called famous, use of a famous trademark in business can be considered unfair competition. Uh, there is a slight difference between well-known trademark and famous trademark. If a trademark is well-known, to use it and confuse the customer is unfair competition. But if the trademark is famous, just use it is an unfair competition, regardless whether it actually caused confusion in the customer or not. So famous trademarks are even better protected compared with well-known trademarks. And under the unfair competition, the registered trademarks, of course, but unregistered trademarks trade dresses, trade names, house names, product designs, and containers are protected in a similar way. They will also be considered to constitute unfair competition. And use of a trade name that confuses customer is a violation of the commercial law also. So, so you need to be very careful not to make any infringement in view of the trademark law or unfair competition law and also commercial law.
with regard to the design, uh, you can use a design protection in a more positive manner. The icons, uh, which is displayed on a computer screen or cell phone screen, are protectable under the Japanese design law. That is recent. But avatars, uh, the character which you see when you play computer games, for example, may not be protected. This is an example of why we said that the law cannot catch up with the technology advancement. The design law was amended recently to include the icons as a protected subject matter. Thus, the definition given by the law is as follows. An industrial design includes a visual image to be displayed on an apparatus to render the apparatus to effectuate its function. That sounds very strange, but it means the icons. This is our protectable subject matter. But because icons are defined in this way, it cannot cover the avatars. So a newly designed avatar can be registered as an industrial design of a product not as an avatar, although the protection would be limited to actual products. So maybe you remember, we said that the design must be registered with the design and also the product in combined, in combination. Therefore, in order to register the design and get the protection for avatar, you need to decide the design avatar is for what product. About copyright, this is more friendly to ARVR world. A creation displayed in a virtual world, uh, I mean ARVR, will also enjoy automatic copyright protection against copying. So it covers avatars, music, dresses, figures, etc., which will be shown or played on ARVR world. When using a creation of a third party in a virtual world, it must be done carefully. So the creation of third party can include buildings, uh, monuments, cars, models, performances of people. If you are going to show these or any one of these things, you must be carefully do it, not to infringe someone's uh, copyright. With regard to unfair competition, uh, we already stated that unauthorized use of a well-known, famous trademark, trade name, etc. can be part of unfair competition. Then we move to cross-border enforcement of rights. And here, uh, cross-border, I mean, uh, this is enforcement between the actual world and virtual world created by AR and VR. Let's see uh, what happens in the classic world, classic enforcement, which is supposing you have a protected right, like patent, in the real world, and someone infringes on your patent in the real world. The IP right owner has an exclusive right to use the IP. Uh, not only patent, but trademark and all other IP rights. The IP right owner can demand others to stop using it or to pay royalties for the use. And the license agreement, including royalty payment, can be a mutually beneficial solution. This is the main purpose of intellectual property right. If you want, you can stop others. If you want, you can give license and get royalty. And if parties do not come to an agreement, the last result is always a lawsuit, demanding compensation of damages and or injunction. In contrast to what happened in conventional war, let's see what will happen across the, the war 
For example, the first example is when an IP right of a real world is enforced against a real world infringement. The first example is patent. But for patent, it is difficult to imagine the patent infringement in the ARVR world because patented product or patented methods are performed only in the real world. Therefore, the infringement occurs in the real world even if it is our ARVR device. As far as that is a device, that can be captured by the patent right, or if that is a patented method, the method performed in the actual world can be a patent infringement in the real world. But the situation is a little different for trademarks. The trademark right is always combined with business activities. Therefore, just showing a trademark unrelated in a manner unrelated to business does not infringe any right. But if trademark is used in connection with business, there is a risk that that is deemed to be an infringement of trademark right, even if it is ARBR work. So you need to be careful about the trademark. A design right, it is unlikely to imagine an infringement of design right by ARVR because design is also connected to the product to which the design is realized. Therefore, as long as you are in ARVR world, it is unlikely that you infringe the ARVR design right. Then the copyright. Then copyright must be, you must handle copyright very carefully because using or displaying in the ARVR world a word which is copyright protected in the real world, you infringe the real world copyright. There is no distinction between the actual world or the RVR world. The copyright protection covers all the unauthorized presentation, copying, and displaying, and all these things of copyright protected product. And about unfair competition, it is a little like trademark. Unfair competition is understood always in conjunction with business activities. Therefore, if there is no business at all, there is no unfair competition. But if uh, there is a business indication in connection with business transactions in ARVR world, then a risk arises of unfair competition. So in the future, it is likely that uh, business transaction occurs in the ARVR world. In that case, you need to be more careful about the unfair competition. Then the last part of consideration is that when an IP right of ARVR world is enforced against a real world infringement, this is a weird situation. The question is, can conduct in the real world infringe the IP right of the ARVR world? Or, in other words, IP right created by the ARVR world? For patents and design and trademark, which require registration at the Japan Patent Office, it is quite unlikely that this new situation arises. But, Again, for copyright, as long as the work displayed in the ARVR world is eligible for copyright protection, which means whether it is a creation of thoughts or emotion, if the answer is yes, 
unauthorized copy or modification in the real world will violate the copyright originating from AR or VR world. So if you show something new in the AR VR world, as soon as it is shown or played in this AR VR world, it has copyright protection. And this protection covers whatever action performed in the actual world also. And about trademark, if transactions in the AR VR world acquire a substantial meaning as commercial activities in the real world, then it trademark rights will be attached to the use. So the ARBL world may possibly be considered unfair competition or uh, based on what you acquire in ARBL world. The activities in the real world might infringe your trademark. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sonada. Now let's look at the last topic, which is the cost for protecting your rights. Uh, IP is notoriously expensive, um, but if you really look at the different categories, actually the costs have become much cheaper, I think, over the last couple of years. So first of all, um, let's look at patents. The cost now for registering a patent in Japan is around 10,000 euros, plus minus 2,000 euros. It depends a lot on translation. Actually, translation is still a big amount of the total cost. Then designs or trademarks you can get already for a much cheaper price, more normally less than 1,000 euros. And copyrights are on for competition, of course, comes for free. When we look at lawsuits, then it looks already a little bit different. To uh, go through a patent litigation, you have to be prepared to pay between 50,000 and 1 million euros. So that's quite a big range. But in general, I think it's fair to say that, at least in Japan, the infringement lawsuits are not as expensive as you can experience it in the America. Then designer trademark, there the cost is between 20,000 euros and 200,000 euros, and for copyright or on for competition lawsuits, between 50,000 and 500,000 euros. Of course, it has to be said that case by case, it can be also different. Then the good news is there are some discounts, actually. The Japanese Patent Office provides discounts for small entities or startups. So, for example, examination fee, registration fee, or annuity fees, you can receive between 50% reduction up to 67% reduction. Who is eligible for that? So, that can be a venture enterprise, a small enterprise, tax exempt corporations, universities, or researchers at universities. If you think you believe belong to one of this kind of uh, enterprises, then you should reach out to your Japanese IP council and ask what kind of documents you have to submit to prove, actually, and then you can profit from these discounts. So this was already our last slide. Um, now we have Thank you, Mother um, san Nikol-san, for the very interesting presentation, being uh, with us here today. And uh, I think that the next slide probably has your details, the contact details, if I'm not wrong. Okay, yes. So, uh, of course, for all those that are interested now, we have uh, time for, uh, of course, some questions and hopefully answers as well. And uh, But you can always uh, shoot me an email if you have any questions, or in this case, as you can see here from the slide, we can be in touch directly with uh, our speakers. And um, so I will leave uh, at this point the floor to the to the audience if there are uh, questions about the, the, the presentation. So okay. if it's also okay for Eva, uh, I will leave maybe a minute or two for uh, the audience to maybe elaborate a question or two. And Mr. Soons, so I'm going to read it first of all. On industrial design, does it include the visual aspect, for example, how the item looks like, shiny, matte, independent of the physical design? 
yes, the, the texture is a part of the design. However, there is some limit uh, because the, the, you must submit a picture or drawing or something to define your design. Therefore, the texture uh, must be understandable from the, the picture or drawing, whatever you, you find in the JPO. Okay, let's go to the second question. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Chingale is asking, I wanted to ask that what is your experience while drafting patent application regarding AR or VR in terms of approach of patent examiner? Oh, the, with regard to the patents, the, there is nothing really special for AR VR because the patent covers many different uh, technologies like telecommunication or the, the display technology like OLED displays, 3D TV. So uh, with regard to the, the patent and description in the patent, I think the, of course we should have a clear understanding of the technology itself and describe the technology in an understanding manner. But that is a common thing with other technologies. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sonoda. So, Mr. Schlüter is asking, I would like to ask if there are already some famous court procedures between global players and startups. In connection with AR, VR, yeah, VR. Yeah. No, I don't think so. So that might come in the future, but so far we haven't seen. Yeah, not in Japan. <clears throat> Okay, I would like to, uh, to, to thank the audience and maybe I have a very last question uh, for one of, uh, of you um, about the probably the best strategy for an applicant from Europe. So what do you think if someone is still thinking about how to enter the Japanese market, is there a, uh, any difference, any benefit in applying directly uh, and file uh, an application with a JPO or maybe go through the national phase from a PCT? What would you recommend in general? Of course, it's a very general question. But... Okay, I, okay, I, I, uh, I recommend that you file an application in your own country or region first. And then within one year, you extend your, your right to cover the, the areas of interest, or maybe Japan, or maybe some other countries like China or US, etc. The reason is that first, the, for the protection of intellectual property rights, the, to file it before others will do is the most important thing, because the second one will be rejected for the reason of the existing first one. So you need to do it quickly. And then the international treaty gives you one year grace period to file an application in other jurisdictions. So you should use this one year to prepare everything necessary to file in other jurisdictions. Thank you, Sonata. You touch uh, on a very interesting topic that maybe, maybe uh, worth uh, expanding for an entire webinar about first first to file and uh, and talk about all these very interesting topics. We will think about that in the future. Uh, so if there are no other questions, um, I would like to thank directly because they are in front of me the the two speakers uh, of today, uh, Nicole and Donaldson. Uh, thank you for being with me and with us, and also Eva from uh, from Brussels, of course, as usual. And of course, all of you uh, in the audience that uh, were interested today in being with us. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you for webinar number 16.